we are really privileged and we are expectantly waiting to hear the perspective and vision of Professor Horton on the learnings that COVID-19 will bring in for the entire world. Professor Richard Horton, now Editor-in-Chief, uh, joined The Lancet, uh, the renowned weekly peer-reviewed general medical journal in 1990. Under his leadership, The Lancet has created a coronavirus resource center available free of cost to help assist healthcare workers and researchers working under the challenging conditions to bring this out, uh, outbreak, not only to contain it, but also bring it to uh, close. He is also an honorary professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, the University College London and the University of Oslo. He was the first president of the World Association of Medical Editors and he is a past president of the US Council of Sci Science Editors. He is a council member of both the UK's Academy of Medical Sciences and the University of Birmingham and is a senior associate of the UK health policy think tank, the Nuffield Trust. Uh, Professor Horton is a qualified, uh, is qualified in physiology and medicine from the University of Birmingham and received honorary doctorates in medicine from the University of Birmingham, UK and the University of Umia in Sweden. Uh, I have great pleasure in now inviting uh, Professor Richard Horton to give his keynote address. Well, thank you very much indeed for that warm welcome. I appreciate the invitation greatly and I wish I could be with you in person in India, which is a wonderful, beautiful country. And uh, I hope it won't be too long before I can be there in person. The title of this session is How the World Will Prepare for Post-COVID. And I want to address that, uh, that title with five questions. What is the current situation? What are the lessons so far? What could we have done better? What is the end game? And what must governments do now? Now, let me say right at the start that the answers to those five questions may seem pessimistic. So let me immediately say that I'm actually quite optimistic about the future. And the reason why I'm optimistic about the future is history. Because we have learned from pandemics in the past is that they change societies, they change governments, and they change the public. They change societies because one society is erased, giving birth to another society. And out of tragedy of the pandemic, there are new societal beginnings. They change governments. And those governments do eventually learn the lessons of the pandemic. And they change the public in society. Health is taken more seriously. It's more valued. We protect our communities better. And those who normally live at the margins of society, who are often invisible and unheard, they are moved to the center of the political stage. Indeed, after the 1918 influenza pandemic, that actually accelerated the pace of political and social change and laid the path for universal health coverage and improved public health in many, many countries. There was a renewal of artistic creativity and indeed the conditions for global regeneration, multilateralism and even the World Health Organization were laid in the aftermath of the 1918 influenza pandemic. So whatever I'm now about to say, please remember that I have that optimistic frame at the beginning. Now let's look at what is the current situation. You know it well. Uh, we have 33.5 million cases so far diagnosed worldwide. That is well understand, a huge underestimate over 1 million deaths, and there are three particular hotspots, the United States, India, and Brazil. And so the pandemic is still raging through the world. It's precipitated not only a health crisis in many countries, but also an economic 
indeed a political crisis in many countries, and there still remains the risk of a breakdown in public order in many settings. The economic costs are massive. The World Bank estimates that over 100 million people will be tipped into extreme poverty by the pandemic with worsening inequality. The pandemic has disproportionately affected the very poorest people in our society and especially women and children. 80 million children in the world today are missing essential vaccinations. Over 1 billion, 1 billion young children and children and young people are out of school. And The Lancet has a commission on COVID-19 that's led by the economist Jeff Sachs. And we met earlier this week and agreed that the situation for children is now an international emergency because we truly risk losing a generation. I think we have not yet faced up to the scale of the transfer of our society that COVID-19 has wrought. The political language that our leaders often use invokes war metaphors, the idea that we are fighting an invisible enemy and we must defeat the virus. But this is conventional war and the virus will not be defeated in the way that one side might defeat the other side in a war. Instead, we are currently renegotiating our relationship with this virus to try and achieve a place of peaceful coexistence. But how we do that is a source of great dispute. Broadly, there are two approaches that are being argued in the world today. First, what has been called zero COVID, that local lockdowns will suppress the virus as much as possible, versus an alternative proposition, which some propose, where we return more to a normal life in our society, trying to protect our freedoms, trying to protect our economy, and accepting that the virus will circulate uh, in our societies. So what became originally a health challenge with technical solutions has now become a political challenge with, with divisions along often ideological lines between those who are more libertarian in their approach to politics and the pandemic and those who would prefer a, a more solidarity-led response where we try and protect our communities by suppressing the virus. And at present, we don't know how this is going to evolve. So we are living in a state of radical uncertainty. That being said, we can learn lessons. So what are the lessons we've learned so far? Well, let me identify what I think are some of the most important. First of all, we've learned that our society is very brittle, perhaps more brittle than we once thought. And the vulnerable groups in our society have been revealed. Those who are older members of our society, those living with chronic illness, uh, in Western countries, Black and Asian minority ethnic populations have been particularly vulnerable. The poor, as I mentioned earlier, and key workers on the front lines of the pandemic, people who work in health, education, transportation, and food. A second lesson, uh, and this is very important, a second lesson is that COVID-19 is not a pandemic. Now, that may seem paradoxical for you to hear me say that. Let me explain. Because COVID-19 is actually a combination of two epidemics. An epidemic of a new virus, SARS-CoV-2, but also an epidemic of non-communicable diseases. There is a synthesis between COVID-19 and non-communicable disease. And when those two intersect, when they combine, that is what is causing the mortality. People with pre-existing disease who get this virus, who contract this virus, are particularly at risk. 
on a background of poverty and inequality, because this virus exploits, exacerbates and accentuates disparity, inequalities in our, our society. COVID-19 is not a pandemic, it's what we call a syndemic, a synthesis of epidemics. And that's an important distinction because the solution to this condition, the solution to COVID-19 will not lie in addressing the virus alone. It will lie in addressing the virus and chronic diseases in our society and inequality and poverty in our society. This is a very, very different challenge than the one that has so far been laid out. And a third lesson, which is also very, very important, is that science has been absolutely central, critically important to not just understanding the, this syndemic, but also in guiding our response. It was on January the 24th that The Lancet first published the very first paper describing COVID-19. And although much remains to be learned, we have we now know so much about the transmission of the disease, the virus itself, the complications of the disease, its spread, its control, the risks, diagnosis, treatments, and how we prevent it. And what is now so important to understand is that as our economies are hit, that is going to hit also science. It's going to hit our universities and colleges. And the projections are that science will be very severely damaged by this syndemic. So it's very important that as we move forward, governments do all they possibly can to protect their ability to generate new knowledge, because it's that knowledge that will act as a protector for those societies in the future. Now, I think we also have to be very honest with ourselves. And this is the third question I want to try and answer. What could we have done better? We need to be ruthlessly honest um, and self-critical because clearly many countries, perhaps most countries in the world, were sadly not prepared for this pandemic. So what should we have had in place to protect ourselves from the pandemic? We need good surveillance systems to be able to pick up new disease threats. We need people, we need a health workforce, nurses, physicians, pharmacists, across a range of different areas that can actually make sure that we are protected, both in terms of our health system, but also our public health system. We need laboratories where the results of testing for this new infection can be carried out. We need policymakers who can act as a conduit of new knowledge to those in government charged with the responsibility for decision making. And we need strong communities because our communities have been under attack by this virus. But worse, we didn't take the signal coming out of China or the signal that came from the World Health Organization at the end of January when Dr. Tedros declared a public health emergency of international concern. We didn't take those signals seriously. We were too slow to respond. A second area where we could have done better is that there has been and remains no global coordination to the response. This is a global syndemic. It demands a global response. And yet there has still not been an occasion when nations have been able to come together to share their understanding, to share their experiences so that we can learn from one another and forge a more constructive coordinated response in the, for the future. And thirdly, I think we've underestimated the importance of communication especially in an era with a radically changed media landscape. We have social media, we have preprints, um, so scientific papers that are published on websites but which haven't been peer reviewed. And all of this 
altered media landscape has created the conditions for what is now called an infodemic. We don't just have a pandemic or a syndemic, we have an infodemic. In other words, an epidemic of information. Information, a huge avalanche of information, some of which is good, but some of which is disinformation or misinformation. And so for governments, it's been absolutely vital to have clear messages and clear leadership over those messages. And the countries that have often been most successful at managing their syndemic have been those countries where they've been able to get very clear lines of communication. Now, let me move on to my fourth question. What is the end game? Because we are all desperate for this to end. The end game that we're putting our trust, our hope, our faith in is the discovery of a vaccine. The current state of play is that there are nine vaccines in phase three randomized trials. These nine vaccines are slightly different to one another. They're based on, in some cases, uh, messenger RNA, in other cases, using an adenovirus vector, or in a third case, using an inactivated virus as a way to stimulate immunity. Some of these vaccines, which are in phase three trials, are actually used already, despite the fact that the phase three trials have not been completed. That's the Russian vaccine and a Chinese vaccine. In total, there are around 140 vaccines that are in various stages of preclinical and early clinical development, in addition to those nine that are in phase three trials. But these vaccines are facing really stiff opposition. And that is because an anti-vaccination movement, which has been in existence for some time, is now regrouping and is working very hard to destroy public confidence in these vaccines. And so when you look at opinion poll surveys, unfortunately, it's becoming clear that public confidence is waning in vaccines. It's vital that those of us who work in healthcare um, do all we can to encourage trust in these vaccines. We also know that we have treatments coming through, we have better diagnostics coming through, but I think if I'm trying to ask, answer that question about the end game, I have to conclude that in truth, as of today, there is no end game at present because the virus is with us, it's endemic, and the goal can only to be to cut community transmission, to keep the R value less than one. A vaccine when it comes will help, but it will not erase from our communities 100%. And why is that? Because a vaccine cannot be a magic bullet. No vaccine is 100% effective or 100% safe or 100% used by everybody in the world. And so, we have a balance. We have to navigate this balance, this renegotiating the relationship, as I said earlier. So let me turn to my last question. What should governments do now? Well, first, I've redefined this pandemic as a syndemic. And so governments must manage this pandemic as a syndemic, focusing on the virus, but focusing on the general health of their populations and addressing inequality. This pandemic has been a moral provocation to us. We've held a mirror up to our society and we've seen what our society is like and we've seen that it's brittle and we've seen that it's vulnerable and we've seen who those vulnerable, vulnerable groups are. And so we now have a moral and ethical responsibility to do all we can to protect those vulnerable groups in our society. Second, what governments must do is to build public health capacities. Systems for surveillance, the, the public health workforce, a strong health system, laboratories, and science and science policy are vital elements to help protect our societies, our nations, our economies in the future. 
And a third area where governments must act is that we must find a way of remembering what has been taking place this year in 2020. We need to remember the over 1 million people who have died. And we need to keep their memories alive. Because the way we have described this pandemic in terms of numbers, statistics, league tables and graphs, this has radically dehumanized the impact of this virus. And we need to rehumanize this crisis in order to truly learn the lessons of it. It is fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, friends, as well as family who have died. It is our obligation to them to remember that sacrifice. So to close, I begin optimistically and I want to end optimistically. I have edited The Lancet for 25 years now. And I have never experienced the kind of cooperation and solidarity and unity of purpose that I have seen from the international medical and scientific community these past 10 months. It has been inspiring for me to observe this level of collaboration. It's true that COVID-19 has challenged us all, but it has revealed the best of us too. COVID-19 is not our destiny or our it was an Indian writer, Arundhati Roy, who said early on in, the, in, in this crisis that the pandemic is a portal from one world to another world. And so this is our moment to rewrite a different future for our families, our friends and our communities, and mostly perhaps for the generations that are still to come. Thank you very much for listening. That was a fantastic uh, lecture, beyond thought provoking. I love the paradigm shift in the whole positioning uh, to have the courage to say this is not a pandemic and then to prove to us, and now we completely agree with you. Uh, we have for a very long time spoken about the, uh, the dreaded problem of non-communicable disease. Uh, I'm going to actually try and sneak in two questions. And one is how do you, do you feel that India's response to COVID was any different from others? And more significantly, how do we tackle the bigger uh, uh, approaching tsunami of non-communicable disease? Thank you very much, Dr. Reddy, for your uh, kind words and for your questions. Um, first of all, um, on India's response, of course, India is a single nation, but it's like a collection of nations. With, with your states and so much of your governance is, is devolved, decentralized to states. Um, I think it would be very presumptuous of me to pass a comment on India's response. Uh, what I know from the statistics is that some states have done very well and other states have, have found it more challenging. Um, and it's very tough for a federal government to manage a country of a size geographically and in relation. I think some things have gone very well in India um, around some areas around testing, but I think there are other areas where it's been really tough. You know, you have migrant populations um, and of course, social mixing is one of the issues that, get, that drives the epidemic. And it's very difficult where you have migrant populations um, who are, are then moving um, because they, the risk of spread is so great. So I think the, the verdict on India's response will be just as it is for most countries, mixed. Um, on NCDs, um, the truth is that although rates of mortality for pretty much all non-communicable diseases are going down, because our population is growing, the total burden of non-communicable disease is actually going up. And so, um, and, and so we are not on top of this challenge by any means. And particularly countries like India um, that are going through a huge demographic change um, with rapid economic growth, unfortunately are creating the conditions for the burden of non-communicable diseases to rise even higher. 
So this is a clear and present danger to our societies. And it, this is not just a health issue. This is an issue that threatens the very foundation of our societies. It threatens the security of our societies. So it's, it's vitally important that one lesson of this syndemic is that we take non-communicable diseases more seriously and prioritize them because it's what leaves us vulnerable to attack by this virus. But thank you for your question. Uh, thank you, Professor. It was a very, very good eye-opener, whatever you said that. We heard it, we believed it, that non-communicable diseases do play an important role in final mortality. But the way you put synth synthesize both together and coin multiple words, syndemic, infodemic, I read your Twitter where you talk about twin, twindemic and criticize it. it's not really a twindemic. What I want to ask you is that uh, you said that the virus, uh, we must learn to be in peaceful uh, coexistence with that, which is uh, which eventually will happen. Can you just throw some light on the timelines when it will truly be a peaceful coexistence? <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's a very um, tough question, but it's a good question. Um, well, look, uh, here's the thing. I know that the that several vaccine trials are going to be completed before the end of this year. Um, let us say, let, let us be hopeful that one of those vaccine trials is successful. It's then going to require that that vaccine um, goes through regulatory approval. That will take uh, that will take some time, several months. Then you have to scale up production, uh, and then you have to have procurement mechanisms. Now, the, the, the is, this is one of the other threats, and the threat of vaccine nationalism, that rich countries with a lot of money buy up the supplies of the vaccine, leaving poorer countries unable to get access to the vaccine. Now, WHO, um, working with the Gavi Alliance and CEPI, have created this facility called COVAX, where something like 160 or 70 countries have come together, uh, rich and, and poorer countries coming together to make sure that if and when a vaccine is available, it will be fairly distributed to countries and to those at particular risk in those countries. Sadly, some countries, such as the United States, have not signed up to COVAX. And that is a threat to the fair and equitable access to a vaccine. But let us say that by the spring of next year, middle of next year, there is a vaccine that's widely available and we use the rest of 2021 to scale up distribution of that vaccine. Then I think that if everything goes well, we could have peaceful coexistence with the vaccine by the end of 2021. <laughs> So you mean to say that next one and a half years, we will be going uh, all over the places with the pan syndemic, not pandemic. Well, I know it's not, this is not a welcome message and it's not a message that makes me happy either. But I, I have to look at the way the virus operates um, in human populations. As soon as you squash it down and then you release your, the pressure um, and there's more social mixing and we don't operate physical distancing and so on, then the virus jumps back. Um, so, you know, we are going to go, I think, through this cycle um, of suppression, release, suppression, release, uh, until either so many people in the population have been um, infected that uh, there is a degree of population immunity, herd immunity, or we have a vaccine and, um, and we can get immunity that way. But that's the only way we can do it. We've got, the only way is through a cycle of short-term lockdowns or mandates to reduce social mixing um, or a vaccine. There's no other way out. That saddens our heart because in the next one and a half years, we'll not only lose the patients because of the syndemic, we'll also lose all those vulnerable societies, children, adults, other non-COVID uh, disease, which we lose big time. But absolutely, and 
this is what, as, a, as a literally a world and we need global coordination because we can't allow these sacrifices to continue. And it is going to mean that those countries with more resources need to be working together with those countries with less resources so that we coordinate our response. Um, and it saddens my heart that we have not been able to work together. Um, indeed, I think it would, you may agree with me, that in fact, some of the divisions between countries have actually got worse, not better. The political rhetoric has got more, uh, has got sharper and not softer. And, and that is a source of deep regret to me. Like Alok and like Sangeeta, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to have you with us, but there are two questions that come to my mind. One, which pertains to you as a doctor and the second that pertains to you as the editor-in-chief of Lancet. Uh, you uh, mentioned about the vaccine as the possibility of finally finding a solution. Why is it that nobody is talking about research in a medication which is antiviral to kill this particular virus, like we found the medi medication for HIV? So there is simply no talk. One doesn't hear much about the research that's going on and neither is your journal uh, publishing anything that I can uh, really recall offhand. The second question uh, that I really wanted to ask you, which pertains to uh, your editorial policy, really, or the philosophy, is that how has the editorial philosophy changed post-COVID? And is, is it likely to change uh, in the future or this particular epidemic going to affect your editorial policy going forward. From the perspective you mentioned about the syndemic, and this is a term I read in your uh, editorial about Merrill Singer's article in the 1990s. And now 30 years later, you revived that term. So from these two questions, perhaps you could give, throw some light on. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Puri. And um, thank you for being such a careful reader um, of the journal. I appreciate that very much. Um, now, you're absolutely right about the lack of work on antiviral medicines. Um, there, has been, there have been and are, are ongoing trials looking at uh, older antivirals against, um, against the, the SARS virus. Um, we know that remdesivir has, has an effect. It's not a very powerful effect. It's certainly not a cure. Um, and we know that some other antivirals don't work at all. Yeah, exactly. Um, what is interesting, though, is that there is a, a new um, therapeutic possibility, which is not going to be widely applicable, but would be very important, could be very important for patients who had severe disease, and that's using monoclonal antibodies. So these biological treatments could actually be very powerful in ways to neutralize the virus before um, the cytokine storm in the body and uh, causes multiple multi-organ failure. So I don't think we're going to have, I don't think we're going to have an antiviral that's going to be available for everybody in our population. But I think that we, I know that we are, that there is work on monoclonals, which could be very important for patients who are admitted to hospital, who have some of the risk factors that we know about, and you could use the monoclonal early in their um, decompensation um, in order to prevent the cytokine storm. And so I'm actually quite hopeful that those monoclonals will come through. They're, we don't have them at the moment, but there are several that are being studied. Now, in terms of our editorial philosophy, that's a very, very, very thoughtful question, which is one that I need to reflect upon. I mean, I tell you what it, what it has done. It's made us passionately, I mean, redoubled our passionate commitment to um, working together with countries um, to be, to take a more global um, approach. It's made me much more um, concerned about the role of science and medicine as a diplomatic tool. Let me explain that briefly. Um, one of the things that we've seen in this um, situation is 
the heads of state of some countries, I'm thinking of President Trump, um, talk about, put the blame on China and talk about this as a China virus or a China plague. Um, now, that upsets me because I know Chinese doctors and Chinese scientists who were in Wuhan and Beijing and managed this outbreak in December and January. And I have the highest respect and regard for them. And I, I have gone on record as saying that we owe a debt of gratitude to those doctors and scientists in China for that early work that they did. And so what, what I have been so impressed with is the international collaboration and cooperation between countries. So I think in terms of how, how has COVID-19 changed our editorial philosophy, I think I would put my emphasis on the importance of fostering collaboration between countries, between peoples, and not being so judgmental about countries. You know, no, no, no country, um, but I tell you, the, the doctors and health workers and scientists who've been on the front lines of this pandemic, they've been saints. And uh, I, think, I think that we, uh, we owe them so much. Professor Horton, I think um, you, you're so right in, in so many things that you said. Um, the, the learning process, the, the underlying disease pattern and how that exasperated the entire situation. The fact that we must think of this as another opportunity to create a new and better world. Uh, your your yeah. entire, you know, the correlation to uh, 19... Uh, 1908 and multilateralism and creativity and innovation, which happened then. Mm -hmm. And I think they are some of these happening. You're absolutely right about, you know, the global collaboration. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that for us um, at Apollo in our hospital, the RP uh, team, the American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin and the BAPIO have mm -hmm. guided our protocol continuously and brought the latest knowledge and been open to learn. So this is one of the most powerful things about clinicians, their ability to network and learn together. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I hope that this and the, the great uh, strides we have taken in digital health and telemedicine, things like this remain with us post pandemic as we emerge re-energized uh, to keeping a population healthy and to individual health, which I think has been, again, one of the big victories of this period, uh, either during lockdown or because of the fear uh, of you know, the increased mortality due to comorbidities, people just enhanced or moved into high gear their entire fitness regimes. And I think that's been powerful as well. But uh, well. as they say, all good things must come to an end. <laughs> And this has been one of the most outstanding sessions, seeing you in person. Our, all our doors are open. Our invitations <laughs> are, are, are with you. Thank you so much. Thank you.